Renee. It's your turn, Daddy. I thought it was your turn. I was waiting on you. Bony fingers pluck a card and slowly transfer it to the stack in the center of the table. After he plays, Daddy fans his cards out and brings his elbows in, hunching forward. As if his failing memory isn't enough, his eyesight is going downhill, too. He looks so much older than his sixty-seven years. We play cards every day. Every single day. He might forget my name, what street we live on his own birthday, or that he doesn't work at the Ford plant anymore. But he never forgets to rifle through the top right-hand drawer in my mother's mahogany china hutch, pull out the bundle of cards banded together, and take his seat at the table across from me. We play until Jesse, his caregiver, arrives. I let him think he whips my butt. The cards we play with are thin and tattered, so old you can barely see the photos of the jazz grades printed on the back of them, Duke Ellington, Dizzy Gillespie, Eartha Kitt. Daddy refuses to play with the new set I bought him. He and my mother played cards together with his set. Memory is a funny thing. It has belongings, smells, and sights, and sounds, and things. The cards belong to a time that he barely remembers anymore. Maybe that's why his grasp on them is so tight. He squints as he peruses his hand his brows pushed closer together by the creases between his eyes. Daddy, he grunts, where are your glasses? You gonna give yourself a headache, all that squinting and staring? No, no, he mumbles, shuffling his cards around. The last time he lost his glasses, I found them in the microwave. There's no telling where they are now. I lay down my next card. Jessie is going to have your hide if you don't find them before she gets here. Jesse coming today? Yes, sir. I'm going to see Maxine and Deborah today. You remember them, Daddy? My friends that used to live down the street from us? Of course I remember. He says, grunting again. Why's Jesse coming? I told you I don't need no babysitter. Old enough to babysit you. Good, because she's not a babysitter. She'll make you some lunch, maybe take you for a walk. Babysitter. He interrupts, slapping a card onto the table. In his more lucid moments... My father is aware that there are long periods of time that he can't remember, flashes of memory pulsing in and out. He's insistent that he's fine. It's just a few spells, old age, it'll blow over. He protests having Jesse here, and they bicker like siblings, but without Jesse, it doesn't work. Deborah and Maxine, my oldest and dearest friends, love Atlanta. The city, the people, the sweet gentility, the slow pace and southern tradition— Born and raised here, I couldn't wait to get out of this place. I took my business degree from Georgia State as far north as New York and as far west as Los Angeles, looking for anything to keep me away from Atlanta. I ended up in Philly, where I got hired on at Simcor, a pharmaceutical manufacturer. That's where I met Marcus. Six foot two, lean and muscular, dark brown eyes, velvety skin the hue of a coconut husk, quiet when necessary. A beast when I needed him to be. I had a good job, a nice apartment, a man I was falling hard for. My mother taught elementary school when I was young. When I was in high school, she quit that job and opened a small bookstore in downtown Decatur. Gladwell Books was the perfect second life for her. A cute little shop that made just enough money to keep it afloat and Mama's hands busy. After her death, Daddy kept it open as an honor to her memory. I really think he couldn't let it go. Between the bookstore and taking care of the house and his card club, a bunch of old men sitting around talking about old women, he seemed busy. Like always, he said he was fine. He didn't need my help. Don't bother him. One of our neighbors had taken it upon herself to watch over Daddy in the house, water my mother's roses, check the mail, basically be a busybody. But she was my lifeline. One evening I'd just come home from work, was changing out of my business suit to meet Marcus for dinner, when I heard my cell phone ringing. I thought it was Marcus, since I was already late. I let it go to voicemail. In the shower, something niggled at me. I felt like I needed to check my messages. I wrapped a towel around myself and found my phone plugged Chapter into Chapter 9 Renee Lorraine! I snapped from deep slumber to confused awake in seconds. The room is dark. The sun isn't even up. 
I sit bolt upright and listen for the sound again. Lorraine! This time the voice cracks, as if on the verge of tears. Accompanying the voice is something like the pitter-patter of raindrops or a fast leak or... No. No, he didn't. I toss the light comforter across the bed, not bothering to throw on a robe over the shorts and oversized T-shirt I wear to bed, and yank open my bedroom door. Standing in the hallway, looking more lost and confused than I've ever seen him, is my father. His face is thin, his eyes blank. He's mostly bones jutting out at appropriate junctures, elbows, pelvis, knees. His V-neck white T-shirt is dingy. His boxers are dark in the crotch. At his feet, a puddle grows, floating on the surface of the wood floor. I groan, not caring if he hears it until my eyes make it back to his face. He looks so ashamed. It breaks my heart. Daddy, what happened? Are you okay? Did you forget to go? I'm sorry, Noodle. I couldn't find the bathroom. Where's the bathroom? Noodle was his nickname for me growing up because my hair used to curl up like a bowl of cooked spaghetti noodles. I smile because he remembered. Alzheimer's is a humiliating disease, a thief, too. It isn't just stealing his memory, but also his self-respect and sheer manliness. What was a virile, athletic, healthy man is now a frail shell, standing in the hallway of a home he owns, trying to remember where we keep the bathroom in this place. It's okay, Daddy. Let's get you cleaned up. I sidestep the puddle and tuck my hand in the crook of his elbow, ushering him back down the hallway toward his bedroom. I find his robe hanging on a hook in the closet, fold the soft hairy cloth over my arm, grab a towel from the hallway linen closet, and walk him to the bathroom, right next to his bedroom. Do you need my help in the shower? He shakes his head, pursing his lips in a pout, and shuffles into the bathroom. I step out, but make a note to myself to check on him in a few minutes. The puddle of urine is soaking into the hardwood, seeping in between the cracks. It won't evaporate on its own, so I get to work. I run downstairs and grab a bottle of spray cleaner, a few towels and a mop, and head back upstairs. I never imagined I'd be on my hands and knees on a Saturday morning, cleaning up a puddle of my father's urine because he can't remember where the bathroom is. I sop up most of the liquid with a towel, spray the area down with cleanser and mop. By the time I am finished, the shower is off, and he's humming a song. I tap on the door. You okay in there? I'm fine, he answers, opening the door and stepping out. His robe is on, cinched tightly around the waist. He smells like body wash, steam billows around him, enveloping me in a warm embrace and dissipating in the coolness of the air. Is my babysitter coming today? He walks past me, chuckling under his breath. A half hour ago, he was about to cry. Now he's alert and laughing, and I'm confused and disoriented. I grab the pile of discarded clothing and the towel from the bathroom floor and add it to a white plastic laundry basket. Any more laundry? I ask as I pass his bedroom. Nope. He rifles through drawers pulling out clothes for the day. You hear me, girl? Jesse coming today? I lean against the door jamb, the basket propped on my hip. Yes, sir, but not for a while. I take a long glance at the twilight peeking from behind the blinds. It's five in the morning. Time to get moving. Can't waste the day. I yawn. I wouldn't have minded a few more minutes of sleep. Do you want some breakfast? He chuckles. Does a bear shit in the woods? Make me some eggs, with cheese, and toast, and grape jelly. We never have grape jelly anymore. You don't like grape jelly, Daddy. Are you going to say please? I ain't saying please. He turns around, tosses a few articles of clothing on the bed, and grabs the ends of the tie to his robe. You best get out of here before you see some things you don't want to see. You are getting rude in your old age. I take his please as implied and leave, closing the door behind me. I listened to him whistle and hum the same tune he'd been humming in the shower. I wish this version of my father could stick around, but I know better. I've had fewer and fewer days with the real Bernard Gladwell. I feel guilty about the sense of relief that washes over me when I see Jesse walk in. Daddy requires so much work and concentration that I am tired by 10 a.m. 
when he develops a new behavior. I worry that he's declining and that I'm losing him, and I'm still not over the loss of my mother. By the time Jesse gets here, I need a break. I turn the reins over to her and escape upstairs to my room. My old bedroom was a place where I'd spent so much of my life growing up. I was shy, and I thought I was plain compared to Deborah and Max. I preferred the company of books and TV to people, especially since no one ever wanted to talk to me unless they wanted me to do something for them. I wanted to feel good about being dependable, but I didn't. Five dozen cookies for the bake sale? Call Renee. She can probably do that. Babysitting this Saturday? Only person I can think would be free is Renee. It's no wonder I was on the first train to anywhere but here. I never thought I'd be back in this room. In fact, I remember telling my mother to turn it into an exercise room or a sewing room or something like that, because I wouldn't be coming back. My mother, while helping me pack, laughed and said, Don't say what you won't do. You never know when you'll have to eat those words. Wouldn't you know it? A few years later, here I am, in my childhood bedroom, less the posters of Prince and New Edition adorning the walls, eating the hell out of those words. I have brunch with the girls today and a tour of Golden Rays. I spoke with the intake doctor a few days ago. He seemed optimistic and said it would be a good idea for me to come down and take a look. If this plan works, it'll benefit me and Daddy. At least I hope so, because I'm not sure how long I can hold up. I'm not cut out for being the sole caretaker of a man in the throes of a disease that makes him irritable, confused, and unable to care for himself. I'm not going to be able to take many more puddles in the hallway. Chapter 15 Maxine I mean, just the nerve, you know? The gall of that woman, me of all people. She was lashing out and taking everyone with her, and I'm not going down like that. But if you know she was just lashing out, how can you still be mad? Easy. You don't understand because she didn't try to link arms with you and call you a whore. She didn't call you a whore, Max. If you remember, it was the other way around. And if you really think that about her, then, well, of course I don't. But she made me mad. Acting like we have something in common. Perched at my vanity table, running through my regimented morning routine. Moisturize. Pluck. Conceal and reveal. Renee's voice sounds tinny through the speakers of my phone, but I need both hands to do this delicate work so I can leave on time. Virgil takes his job seriously, and if I'm not there to begin the staff meeting at 8.30 a.m. sharp, he's testy with me all morning, as if I wouldn't fire him and throw his stylish, snappily dress behind out in the street. I guess I wouldn't. Virgil knows that, which is why he's so damn bossy. I'll make up with Deborah when I'm good and ready. I can't just let this blow over, you know? No, I don't know, says Renee. I hear shuffling in the background and what sounds like Bernard asking her something. Her voice is muffled as she answers him, and after a moment she comes back to the phone. Sorry, we're running late this morning and he's mad about it. I better get some breakfast on before I have to head to the shop. Isn't that what Jessie is for? She's not the maid and I want him to know I'm doing things for him. I don't want him to wake up one day and think I've shoved him off onto someone else. I'm sure he knows, Renee. It sounds funny because my mouth is open while I apply mascara. I flick the wand from root to tip, expertly darkening each lash and separating the lashes with a miniature comb. I bet my eyes at myself in the mirror and smile, pleased. I don't know about that, but just in case, I want to do it while I can. I don't know how much longer I'll be doing it. I pluck a tube of lipstick from my collection of designer shades and smooth a deep crimson onto my top and bottom lips, rub them together, and blot them with a Kleenex. Did you check into that retirement home? How did it look? Yeah, I went up there. She fills me in on her tour of the facility. Sounds cushy. A nice place to spend your twilight years. Renee sounds skeptical. It's an option. I don't think now is the time. If there's ever a time to put him in a home. If ever? I stop fluffing my hair just out of heated rollers. The curls are gorgeous, big and bouncy. But I know as soon as I hit the humid Georgia air, they'll fall like a rock. You can't take care of him forever. You know that, right? What if he falls or something? He falls all the time. He's going to break something soon. I hear a crash in the background and a male voice cries out. 
Daddy, Renee yells, without bothering to pull the phone away from her mouth. I'm making your eggs right now. Stop it! More grumbling, more yelling, more noise. I hurt you. I'm doing it. Go watch the news or something. Getting on my nerves. The doorbell chimes over the din. That's Jesse. Thank God. This man has lost his mind, throwing around Mama's pants. She blows an impatient puff of air into the phone. Look, I've got to go before he sets something on fire. Call Deborah, all right? She really needs us right now. I'll think about it. Maxine. Fine. I will call her. Later. Okay, just make sure you get in touch with her soon. I don't want this whatever to go on too long. She needs us. You said that, Renee. I'll do it. I need to go. You're making me late. I push myself back from the vanity table and pad into my favorite spot in my condo, a spacious walk-in closet, an entire room unto itself. It makes me happy to step inside and be enveloped by rows upon rows of fine fabrics and classic materials that stand the test of time and fashion. I design the closet, from the glass-top shoe drawers to ample space to hang dresses, skirts, slacks, coats, whatever I feel like storing. My favorites are always hung in the section closest to the door. While I love to try new couture, luxury lines and styles, and be a little daring, my daily wardrobe is more classic cuts, and I wear some selections more than others. I thumb through my choices until I find something that speaks to me, a beautiful Prada dress, and pair it with black leather four-inch heel slouch boots to match. I practically skip out of the closet and rush back to the bedroom to dress. I toss off my thick terry cloth robe and drape it across the edge of the already made bed, step into the dress and the boots. They zip easily and fit just right, hugging my feet in decadent leather. I check my reflection in the full-length mirror that hangs on the closet door, smoothing the dress over my hips and smile at my perfect size for a frame. From the jewelry box, I select an understated diamond solitaire and clasp it around my neck, insert matching diamond studs in my ears, and pick up a platinum Gucci watch. Lastly, I drip a few drops of Dolce and Gabbana, the one, around my neck. Satisfied, I pick up my purse from a table in the hall, toss the phone into the bag, and walk out, locking the door behind me. My Maserati sits safe and sound in her spot in the secure parking garage. A swipe of a finger unlocks the door, and I climb in, press the ignition button, and pull out of the garage. I don't live far from the office, a detail that I didn't plan, but it happened to work out for me. I bought the condo at a steal from a client who was trying to unload it. Renovations took months, but when it was complete, it was everything I ever dreamt a home could be. The original construction was sound, high ceilings, thick noise-canceling walls between units, I had real hardwood floors installed in the entryway, living room and dining room, and marble tile laid in the kitchen and bathrooms. I tore out walls and built new ones, had the entire place wired for surround sound and high definition, and generously coated the place in a brilliant white paint. Deborah says she feels uncomfortable in my place because it's so pristine. White walls, white leather furniture, stainless steel appliances and fixtures— when I could get what I wanted, I went for it. It's just another thing she doesn't understand about me. Despite what I said to Renee, I have been thinking about Deborah. It's been weeks since I heard from her. In the past, she's always been quick to reach out and make up. She's good at offering the olive branch. I'm good at taking it. Granted, we both have apologies to make, and I guess I'm waiting to see how long she's going to hold out, but I'm probably the last thing on her mind. It's unlike her to be so emotional, such a live wire, so reactionary. Deborah is our even keel, cool and calculated. She's the calm to our storm. If Deborah falls apart, Renee and I have no hope. I flash my badge at the security gate, park in my reserved spot, and catch the elevator going up just as the doors are closing. I press the button for the top floor and squeeze in. Donovan Luxury Realty leases space in one of Atlanta's most prestigious high-rises. From my desk, my view is midtown, downtown, and beyond. From the bustling metropolis to suburban eclectic to exclusive gated upper-crust real estate. My fellow passengers are three men in finely tailored Italian suits, anxiously checking watches or tapping touchscreens. 
trying to appear as if they aren't taking sidelong glances in my direction. I'm used to it, but that doesn't mean I don't notice it. I also notice wedding bands, or, in the case of one man, the telltale indent where a ring usually sits. He's the one staring the hardest. One by one, they step off at their respective floors. At thirty-three, the doors soundlessly slide open. The elevator lobby, also Virgil's domain, is in its usual elegant state, with morning sun warming delicate white orchids and vacuum stripes in the deep pile carpet. Appearance is everything. If you don't make a good first impression, you've already lost the client. I throw open the double doors to the Donovan suite and step inside, ready to conquer the day. The Monday sales meeting has become an episode of The Young and the Restless, or more appropriately, The Rich and the Spoiled. My agents, seated around the oblong cherry wood table, offer updates on open, stale properties. These go on a list that I call the trouble list, which is reviewed weekly. Virgil and I determine action items to move them to closing. Virgil begins with an update on the Newman listing. Last week we met with Fletcher Callahan, Braxton Newman, and his attorney. Adora Newman signed a prenuptial agreement. She's surprised to find herself basically tossed out on her ass at only two years into a marriage that she expected to last much longer. So long as she refuses to sign the divorce papers, Braxton is legally obligated to take care of her. We agreed that Braxton would approach Adora with a cash offer, to include moving her to one of his other properties where she will live rent-free for a period of six months. This will give her funds to live on and get back on her feet, as it were. Virgil stops to drop a sardonic chuckle. Adora is an exotic dancer. With a name like Adora, I don't think she could do anything else. When was Braxton going to offer her the money? And how soon can he move her out? The place needs to be cleaned and staged. He was supposed to have met with her over the weekend. I'll call him as soon as we're out of this meeting and get an update. I nod. Virgil tips forward and bends his head over his notebook. He scratches a few lines dots the last sentence with a flourish and drops his pen. Jonathan, tell us about the Stone Mountain property. At six three, three hundred and fifty pounds, deep bronze skin and honey brown eyes, Jonathan looks more like a pro linebacker than a seasoned real estate professional, but he's been with me the longest. He and I worked for Coldwell Realty before I flew the coop to start my own firm. Jonathan showed up on my doorstep two weeks after I launched Donovan with a vision for serving Atlanta's elite population with delectable properties. He agreed to a trial run on nothing but a handshake and sold his first home for Donovan a week later. We've been in business ever since. His property is a $1.6 million home within a gated community, perfect for an up-and-coming doctor, well-to-do attorney, or even a junior politician. The surrounding neighborhood lands it on the trouble list. For a mile on either side of the gates, the homes are run down with peeling paint, boarded-up windows, unkept yards with broken-down cars parked in full view and on prominent display. There was a break-in last week, which I discovered when I went to prep the place for a showing. Pretty much cleaned the place out of copper pipes and wires, took a few appliances. The property owners filed a police report. Thankfully, everything is covered under insurance. My problem is that now they want to sell as is. They don't want to buy new appliances. What about the pipes and the wiring? The electrician and plumbers will be out this week to do an estimate of what it will cost to replace it. They're talking about pulling the house off the market. For how long? Until they replace everything? Presumably. It's either that or lower the price to under a million and let the new owners worry about a dishwasher. The expression on my face likely reveals my thoughts on this situation. I glance at Virgil, knowing he can read my mind. He clears his throat and leans forward, fiddling with his pen as he speaks. Donovan isn't selling a mini-mansion as is like a foreclosure. If they have to pull it off the market to get it fixed, fine. But stay on them. We need to close this sale. That's my plan. I've pulled it down from the listing service, and as soon as I hear from the owners, I'll update you with an ETA as to when it will be available again. If there's no new business, let's wrap this up. I close my notebook and twist my Mont Blanc pen closed. A flurry of activity and low murmurs follow as my staff, four agents and Virgil, push away from the conference room table and file out of the room. I linger for a few moments, lost in thought as I scan the Atlanta skyline through the floor-to-ceiling window. I have to get this Deborah thing out of the way. 
I'm not good at groveling, which is why I always make her come to me first. It doesn't seem like she's going to come this time. May as well get it over with. In my office behind the closed door, I take a seat and dig out my mobile phone, scrolling to the M's in the address book. When I reach Deborah Macklin, I hold my finger over the number. I used to think nothing of bothering her in the middle of the morning, especially a Monday. Before I can change my mind, I press the icon to call Deborah's desk. Deborah Macklin. I toy with pretending to be angry, but lose all resolve once I hear her voice. She sounds so tired. Deborah, it's Max. She's quiet for a moment, then breathes a sigh of relief. Honestly, I feel relieved, too. Max, hi. I'm so glad you called. Hang on a second. I hear her put the phone down, the muffled sound of a door closing, and she's back. Okay, I needed a little privacy. A little privacy would have probably been a good idea when you were doing the P.E. teacher. She chuckles, despite her morose tone. I'm going to let you have that one, because I owe you an apology. Surprised, my eyebrows lift. Do you now? I know you've been waiting for me to come around. I just... She forces out a heavy breath. I feel its weight across the line. I don't know what I'm doing, you know? I didn't mean for what I said to hurt you, and I'm so sorry I said it. I'm sorry for what it meant to you to hear that. I didn't mean that you and I were alike. Not in that way. Just... Just? I prod. I've never had man problems before. She admits quietly. Little does she know how jealous this makes me. You have men eating out of the palm of your hand. Haven't you ever been caught between the affections of two men? Haven't you been bored with one and sought out excitement with another? My affair, my marriage... They're a big, huge deal, but on a very basic level. I guess I thought you might have some advice for me. That would make sense if you would have... I pause, remembering Renee's words. This isn't about me. First of all, I'm sorry for calling you a whore. I don't think that about you, and I never did. It was just the wrong thing I could think of to call you, and it fell out of my mouth, and it never should have. Okay? Okay. I hear the small smile in her voice. Deborah is so easy to please. Secondly, honey, have you talked to Willard? She sighs. Yeah, some. Yeah, and? And, well, it looks like I might be moving out. I grip the phone so it doesn't slide through my fingers. Deborah and Willard have the most stable relationship I've ever seen. Or so I thought. You're kidding. No. That day that I left brunch, I... I, uh, ended up in bed with David. She ends the sentence on a whisper, and I feel my eyes roll. I can't help it. Really, Deborah? I know, I know. I fell asleep and woke up late. I'd missed calls from Renee and Kendra. Kendra had called Willard looking for me. I knew he'd be able to guess where I was. He didn't say anything to me all week. But last night he came home early and he was typing something up in his office. Later on he dropped it on me, laid it out. Dropped what? Laid what out? A letter. He said he'd been giving me some time to sort things out, but that I'd made it clear where my priorities are. He said either I go before the holidays so we don't have to pretend for family, or he goes and takes Kendra. A sob caught in her throat. Can he do that? Can he take my baby? I don't even know what to say. I'm so ashamed of myself. Damn, girl. I think you need to stop feeling sorry for yourself and call a lawyer. I guess maybe I do. I was hoping. You're not really going to leave, are you? Like, move out of your own house? He expects me to. Or he leaves with Kendra, and I don't want her uprooted like that. I know it doesn't help, but if you need anything, a place to stay or someone to be there while you cry into a glass of wine, you know my number. Thanks, she says through sniffles. A long, protracted bell sounds in the background. Oh, that's me. Gotta go. I feel like I haven't done any work today, and I have so much of it to do. You stay away from that P.E. teacher, you hear me? He's nothing but trouble. She chuckles a sad little patter of laughter. I think it's a little late for that. The superintendent knows. I gasp. How did she find out? Somebody's big mouth. There's so much going on. I also had to talk to Kendra. My jaw drops. Girl, you've been keeping all of this to yourself? I know. It's bad. 
Well, one of my clients is having a big party in a couple of weeks, and I told Renee that we three were going. You should come shopping with us this weekend. You need your girls right now. Oh, Max. She sighs, sounding dejected. I don't think I'm up for a party. It's a cocktail party. You stand around with a drink in your hand and eat and gossip. You can do that for two hours. Think about it. She sighs, mumbles something about having to get to work, and hangs up without saying goodbye. Chapter 23. Debra. The first thing I do when I get to my office, after the kids are in classes and the front office is clear of students and the secretaries are tapping away at their computers, is sit down at my desk and pick up the phone. Superintendent Johnson's office, Sandy speaking. Hi, Sandy. This is Deborah Macklin over at Morningside. Is Bernice in? I just need a minute of her time. One moment, Miss Macklin. Sandy puts me on hold and light rock music fills the empty space until the line picks up again. Deborah, I'm surprised to hear from you. What's going on? Hi, Bernice. I think there's been a development, and I hope you can help. I speak with Bernice for a half hour, explaining the things I'd spoken with Kendra about over the weekend. My concerns are myriad, my staff undermining my authority in front of the students, the students talking to their parents about it, the parents planning an airing of grievances at the PTA meeting scheduled for Wednesday. I understand your concern, Deborah. I'd be concerned, too. Is there any way that you could call the PTA president and request that— I'm laughing before she even finishes her sentence. You know Charlotte Rogers doesn't like me. She's probably so giddy about this she can't see straight. If I ask her to cancel the meeting, she'll laugh in my face. But what if you called her? Oh, Deborah, I'm really trying not to get involved here. People know that we are friends, personal friends— I feel like they think I'm taking your side. Aren't you? Aren't you supposed to take up for the teachers, for the staff? My job is to look out for the children. She responds, adding coldness and a terse edge that she's never used with me before. I sympathize with your situation. I truly do. And I can use what powers I have to straighten the situation out. But you cannot run to your friend, the superintendent, to fix your problems. If you want that meeting canceled or postponed, you're going to have to make the request. I don't care who doesn't like you. You're the principal, and that carries some weight. I sigh as my shoulders drop. My head feels heavy, and I'm suddenly so tired. I haven't slept soundly in such a long time, especially at Maxine's. All I want is to go to my house and get in my bed and sleep for days and days. And maybe if I just never woke up, everyone would be happy. Deborah? Deborah, are you there? Yeah. I sit up, snapping to attention. I'm here, and I hear you. Thank you for speaking with me, Bernice. Sure. And if you need anything, I don't hear the rest of the sentence because I hang up. What good does it do me to be friends with the superintendent if she can't help me? Frustrated, I pound my fist against the desktop, just as my office door opens. Mrs. Macklin? Phyllis Andrews, one of my assistant principals, is standing in the doorway with a uniformed member of the security team. We have a situation. I walk with them to Miss Andrews' office a few doors down the hall. Seated in one of two chairs is a girl that looks like she could be over at the high school. Her face is mature, more womanly than childlike. The bangs of a badly sewn-in weave hang over her face, but I can see her dark eyes glaring at me. Hello, I greet her taking a seat in the chair near her. Her skirt is short, a dress code violation, but I'm not going to nitpick right now. Her thick, shapely legs are crossed at the knee. She's wearing ankle socks and platform Mary Janes. Her blouse is a short-sleeved white button-up, but she's left enough buttons open to reveal ample cleavage. I'm Mrs. Macklin. I know who you are. She hurls at me. You the one that's been fucking the coach. Anitra! Miss Andrews barks sharply. Language! And sit up! You're talking to the principal of this school. If you want to remain a student here, she's the one that's going to save your hide. The girl sits up, uncrosses her legs, then crosses them again the other way. She folds her arms over her chest and glares in my direction. She sighs loudly and rolls her eyes to the ceiling. I turn to Phyllis. What's going on? Why is she in your office and not in class? Mr. Lauren called me down to his office to retrieve her. The security officer explains. He found her there waiting for him, and she wouldn't leave. I turn to the girl, Anitra, and ask her, 
Did you need to speak with Mr. Lauren about something? A hint of a smile crosses her lips. I went down there to see if he wanted to have a little fun. Seemed like he was into breaking rules. If he'd fu She pauses, then starts again. If he'd do it with you, then why wouldn't he do it with me? Well, you're a student, for one. So? I'm more woman than these babies walking through these halls. Shit. Anitra. Look, whatever, y'all. She jumps up from her seat, hovering over me. I went down there to see if he wanted to have some fun. He ain't want to. He called you to come get me. You kicking me out of here or what? I lift a hand in a show of surrender and as calmly as possible tell her, Sit down, Anitra. Let's just talk. She plops back into her chair and tosses one leg over the other. I glance at Phyllis and nod my head toward the door. She and the security guard step out, pulling the door shut behind them. Okay, now that it's just us, I hope you can lose the attitude and the language. How old are you? Fourteen. She mumbles. And what grade are you in? Eighth. But I'm supposed to be at the high school. Okay, so why are you here? Because I keep quitting. My mama say I'm running with a bad crowd, skipping school and whatever. She sent me up here to my auntie's house, because the schools are better. Kids is the same everywhere, though. And you went down to see Mr. Lauren because you heard about what was going on between him and I, and you thought he would be interested in you because of that? Her soft expression retreats, and the glare returns. Don't act like you can't imagine it. I'm younger and prettier. I disagree with the prettier part, but on the youth angle, she has me beat. She sucks her teeth and shrugs her shoulder. Anyway, my boyfriend doesn't have no car and ain't no metro train up here. It take him all day to come up and see me, and he real lazy, so I ain't seen him in a while. I be lonely and stuff. And Mr. Lauren, he kind of remind me of Duke, you know? That's my man's name. Duke? Yeah. His daddy named him Ducati, after that motorbike. She shakes her head. I think that's a girl's name, but... Anitra sucks her teeth again and levels her gaze at me. You know that it's wrong to approach a teacher for sex, correct? And it would be wrong for him to agree to it? Yeah, but... but nothing. What happened between Mr. Lauren and me is our business, and it has no bearing on the laws of the state and the regulations at this school. Now tell me, if you get kicked out of Morningside, where do you go next? She stares at the floor before she mumbles an answer. Mama says she's going to send me away to some youth camp for bad kids. They wear prison uniforms and work all day and don't get to see nobody until they're cured of bad behavior. Do you really think she'd send you there? She shakes her head slightly, then shrugs her shoulder. I don't know. I didn't think she'd send me up here, and she did. So I guess she'd carry out her threats. Do you want to stay at Morningside, Anitra? Or are you trying to get kicked out so you can drop out and be with your boyfriend? Because as much as I care about your education, I won't fight you. If you don't want to be here, I don't want you here. We can find an alternative school. I can talk to your aunt and your mom. Nah. She interrupts. I don't want you talking to nobody, saying nothing. I got to finish out this year. When I can get a job, maybe I quit. Well, it's a start, I think. And then I think how crazy it is that I consider an intention to stay in school until one is old enough to work instead to be a good start. Anitra and I come to a tenuous agreement. She'll stay out of trouble and stay away from Mr. Lauren, and I won't kick her out. And we won't tell her aunt or her mother about today's episode if she keeps her nose clean. Think about it, I tell her, as we're walking out of Miss Andrews' office. It's just a couple of weeks until Christmas. You get two weeks off and you can go and see Duke. And only five months until you're out at Morningside and done with us. You can hang in that long, can't you? Anitra nods, heaving her book bag onto her shoulder. I can do that. Thanks, Mrs. Macklin. You're welcome. Now button that blouse and pull that skirt down. Tomorrow I want to see you in clothes that don't violate my dress code. She makes her way down the hall and out of the office. I turn to Phyllis and the security guard, nod and walk back to my office. Back at my desk, I pick up the phone and ring one of the secretaries. Hi, could you get me the PTA president's phone number? Yes, Charlotte. Email it to me. Thanks. I hang up and sit back in my chair. I feel so much pressure in my chest. It's like an elephant is sitting on me. The PTA discussing this issue is going to be like a room full of Anitras, people who think they can get away with anything because I did it first. I broke the rules. I disregarded policy. I put people's careers in jeopardy. 
My computer dings. A new email has arrived. Charlotte Rogers' phone number is staring at me, taunting me, daring me to call her. I pick up the phone, dial half of the number, but set the handset back down as the bell rings, reverberating through the walls. The loud sounds of children in lockers and teachers fill the air. My door opens and another assistant principal has a question. A teacher drops off a form and stays to chat for a minute. The janitor stops in to chit-chat, and by the way, have I thought about ordering such-and-such such for the boys' bathroom. I decide to call her after lunch. Maybe.